Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done. Yo bros, we're back for another Yo Elliot show. And today I got a really cool guest, somebody that you may be familiar with on my Friday CMAS uh, podcast that I do with a couple other Catholic fellas, men, Catholic masculinity is what we talk about, but he's also written a book called Don't Go to College. And so that's what I want to talk with Dr. Michael Robillard here today about, but before I introduce him, uh, I'm, I'll preface this by saying I'm going to share a story and then I'm going to read the description of the book because it's written so damn well, and I'll introduce him that way. It's worth it's worth waiting for. But uh, I have not read the book for full p- transparency, but by the title of the book, I'm all bought in. Don't go to college. And it's interesting, you know, I tend to be an early adopter in a lot of things that people don't understand when I'm doing it, and then at some point it comes full circle and it becomes uh, mainstream. And so a lot of people are realizing now, don't go to college. It's it's not even, I don't even think it's that big of a deal to say so, but 18 years ago, 18 years ago when my first daughter was born, so 2004, I believe, uh, I had already seen that college was a hoax. And then when I followed the presidential uh, debates for 2008, I started hearing Ron Paul and what he spoke about the Federal Reserve Bank, our fiat currency, and the propping up of different um, sectors in our economy, and, and universities is one of them. Over, we overpay for it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's inflated. It gets young people into debt that becomes an anchor for their whole lives. I didn't see it for what Dr. Robillard is gonna talk about today, which is the indoctrination of it. It just seemed like a, a bad investment uh, unless you were going to be a doctor or a uh, engineer or something of that that nature, and our, our, obviously our guest is a doctor, so he must see some value in it, but probably not the way we use it today. And so, uh, real quick, product description because it's just so good, I got to read it. So the book is uh, "Don't Go to College," and is co-authored with uh, uh, Timothy Gordon. And so here we go: uh, an examination of how America's colleges have become an intellectual hell on earth for anyone who wishes to think rationally and seek truth and wisdom, as well as a plan for how young citizens can claim and safeguard the learning and heritage to which they are entitled. From safe spaces and trigger warnings to grievance studies and neo-Marxist indoctrination to sexual degeneracy and hookup culture, to student loan indentured servitude, to useless degrees with no translatable real world application, the modern day American university now functions as the complete inversion of its original purpose. Rather than creating civically minded, competent citizens and adults able to provide for themselves, their family and their society, 
America's universities now function as an institutional assembly line for the production of the new 21st century global citizen surf, atomized, infantilized, dependent, and pacified. This book provides the definitive diagnosis of what exactly happened to America's universities while giving the reader a blueprint for how young citizens, parents, and local communities alike can safeguard, escape, and begin resisting such pernicious indoctrination and illogical woke nonsense. Dr. Michael Robillard is an independent scholar, philosopher, and Iraq war veteran. He has held prior academic appointments at the University of Notre Dame, uh, the University of Oxford, the U.S. Naval Academy. His past writings have focused on issues concerning civil military relations, veterans issues, and ethics of automated technology and free speech in academia. He is a devout Roman Catholic, an American, and a patriot. He hails from Whitman, Massachusetts. Thank you, Dr. Michael, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Elliot. Really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, man, it's pretty cool. You know, you and I rap uh, every week with a group. Well, uh, you know, it was the first time I read your bio and realized how... Um, how much you've done and how much you do and how much you're wrapped up in the work that you share uh, to be a man that has these degrees and speaking at universities and uh, with the name doctor, the DR before his name, what is it that makes you say that don't go to college and that college is a bad idea? Well, the, the long and short of it is that I do value education. I do value knowledge. I do value the the idea of academia and of university that is the the inheritance of our, our Catholic and, and uh, Aristotelian, Aristotomist background that helped build the West and helped build America. So in principle, that's that's what I grew up on when I went to, to West Point and, and the degrees I got afterwards. While I was getting my degrees, though, I led, I led a very cloistered life that was very um, also uh, degenerate and and disordered along with a lot of like liberal secular hedonist ideas and practices and that blinded me to to the rot that was going on in the university and it took really getting to oxford and running into the transgender issue that made me realize everything and realize just how rotten the institution has become and made me go back to really figure out what are the things about the university that were, that are good and require saving and, and which need need to be jettisoned. So that's that's the short answer. It's pretty amazing. You came up with like one foot in each world. You've got the Aristotomistic view of the studies you were engaging in, but mm -hmm. also the social uh, experiment paradigm of uh, wokeness and feminism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. you know, the rot of our society. So it's interesting. You... Uh, you sort of uh, straddle those two and have mm -hmm. a perspective from both. And so I think that gives you uh, insight that many people might not have, that there's something good there. Because I'm sort of an extremist and I'm not a scholar, <laughs> right? But I like learning. I love reading. I mm -hmm. love independent learning. As I get older, I'm appreciating institutions way more. Um, but you've really benefited from the institutional educational processes of universities and is it served you so well such that you are, you're 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 also using that you know rhetorical skill and that thinking skill to point out why college is ruining Americans can you tell us a little bit more about that side of the picture um the the, the ruinous side like let's get the, the bad news out of the way um what do you mean by indoctrination and, and where how is it how did we get here and where are we going Right, right. So there's a, a Fox News article that myself and Timothy Gordon wrote last year that you can find talking about the five major reasons that we outline for why college is a bad idea now. So first, yeah, it's the the ideology and indoctrination. Uh, if you do a Google search for uh, d uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, or uh, LGBT or any of these things, as with respect to these universities, it's 
a super majority of universities that they, they have some sort of uh, explicit commitment to any of these things, whether it's the language of diversity, equity, and inclusion, empowerment, uh, the various studies, you know, various grievance studies, um, women's studies, trans, queer studies, all this stuff. And this used to be the postmodern stuff that was contained to the edges of academia, to the edges of the, the lit crit department. You know, so the, the philosophical tradition, analytic philosophy that I grew up in, we used to laugh at this stuff and never took it seriously. It's since broken out and overtaken not just philosophy, but but all of academia, and now it's bleeding out into all the rest of the culture. And uh, these folks, they are ideologues. The professors are neo-Marxist ideologues. Anytime there is a conservative speaker like right. Ben Shapiro or Michael Knowles, they, they riot, you know, they, they, they attack people. In our book, we list 75 examples of campus physical assault or, or, or uh, you know, mob behavior that's happened within the last five years alone. Right, it's violent. Uh, so they don't want to... It's violent, yeah. Yeah, there's a professor um, from California who hit somebody in the head with a bike lock. And uh, this guy's a professor. So, I mean, th these people... Right. It's they, funny because the these are the same people that uh, virtue signal and their whole position is that they're more, more morally righteous than those who don't uh, agree, and we're seeing their violence uh, explode on the scene. It's so obvious to see they're the more angry of the of the two. You know, if we're talking Aristotomic or talking patriarchy, mm -hmm. masculinity uh, versus degeneracy, which is what we see in in this uh, in their anger uh, and in their perversion. It's interesting. I remember learning. You keep using the word, you know, neo marxist and some people may not know. Mm -hmm. um, but tracking backwards from where we are today and what we're talking about in the universities, uh, there was a theory that came out in the 1930s um, by the likes of neo marxists including mm -hmm. uh, Anto well, not Gramsci, but Herbert Herbert uh, Marcuse. I, I can't remember his name, but and Wilhelm Reich. Marcuse. That's yep. right. Yeah, Marcuse. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm called critical theory critical mm -hmm. theory and critical critical theory you know is not a new thing i know there's a lot of fighting in our schools about critical race theory that's just sort of a new fangled brand of it as it's you know gaining momentum um but they called it critical theory and, it's, and the reason why it's called critical theory is because its whole its whole point of being is to criticize every aspect of society in order to destroy it morally mm-hmm yeah. Uh, from the inside yeah, out certainly and so everything is on the chopping block everything is on the chopping block in terms of its directionality towards truth goodness beauty uh christian values christian metaphysical and epistemological commitments but then when the criticism is leveraged back the other way and we say okay well what's your alternative now let's talk about the let's apply criticism to marxism neo-marxism diversity, equity, inclusion, LGBT, you know, let me give you some of my thoughts as to my criticism of these things. That's when the door shuts. So it's this, this front you're end appeal allowed. to, you're not allowed. You're, you're, you're no platformed, you're silenced, uh, the, the, you're doxxed. So there's an appeal to open mindedness, open mindedness and tolerance as a rhetorical tool to then gain institutional power and then pull the ladder up behind them and to silence people that, um, that they don't agree with. So it's, it's a complete hypocrisy. Right. Anybody who has eyes can see that because if your ideas were so good, then why can't we have an open conversation yeah. about it without calling yeah. names? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And, they, and, and I think they know that they, yeah. they say they have the moral high ground, but they don't. I know. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I, I grew up in the nineties in Massachusetts in like a JFK labor left, you know, uh, community. My dad was a forklift operator. So I always thought, uh, I had like old school liberal values that, okay, yeah, we should have like an economic social safety net to care about the poor. But that at that left, that liberalism is gone and it's been completely hijacked by the, these, these like rain, rainbow clad thugs that, uh, they, they, they don't want to debate. They, they are anti-Christian, anti-West, anti-truth, anti-free speech, anti-everything. It's, it's, a, it's, uh, anti-father, anti-family, anti-God. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so um, let's talk about, you know, we, we mentioned it's 
root, right? Which you, know, you could go as far back as the, as the garden, of course, but I want to do that. We're mm -hmm, talking mm -hmm. Marxism in the West. Um, yep. And, you know, it started out, you know, they really just started out as a uh, economic sort of, uh, and then, you know, a political mm -hmm. uh, power grab or, or power play to now this cultural one where it's, it's really, it's fragmented or decentralized, but much more powerful as a result because they've got mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. like uh, guerrilla warfare going on by having yep. their ideas proposed in media, music, newspapers, I mean, everywhere and everything. And we're just talking about the universities. Mm -hmm. Certainly, yeah. This is, I mean, Gramsci explicitly pointed this out as the the long march through the institutions. And as you mentioned, yeah, media, entertainment, uh, law, military, uh, language, and uh, the other culture, big cultural institution being academia, being that if you can capture those those higher order institutional chess pieces, then everything that is downstream from those are, are going to be permeated with, with this pernicious ideology. And they knew it, and they, they, they at least began that long march from you know, the, the 30s through the, the 60s radicalization with the um, countercultural you know, hippies, beatniks, uh, you know, women's feminist movement, and, and now we've, we've, inher we've at least inherited three generations of the embryonic seeds of, of this ideology really taking full flourishing in the last five years. And it goes back even further, as we point out in the book, really to the beginning of the Enlightenment and the removing of Aristotle from the Western mind, the removing of telos or, or final causality. And that's that's where we we identify the, the big fissure in the academic system as uh, being right. located. Which is basically remove God. Remove God. Yeah, you, you remove God and you remove God's signature from the intelligible world. So no, a, a foot is no longer, it has a purpose for standing. Uh, the human beings, uh, men and women, no longer have a, a potential for motherhood and fatherhood and family. Uh, you know, there, there's no intelligible end or directionality to the apprehendable universe. Rather, everything just gets collapsed to, to mere mechanism to include human beings. And you can see right. how the beginning In one of that. Word you could say chaos. Ca yes, the chaos. Yeah, the chaos begins with the removal of Aristotle, and and indirectly God. Right. Yeah. So uh, you know, chop the head off, and and the you know the body is, becomes uh, dangerous and useless. Uh, no leadership, no head, no patriarch, mm -hmm. no father, no God, no families. Um, while we're spitting in that direction, I think it would be helpful. So we talk about the removal of God, but what are some of the other, um, we keep using the word ideology, right? So what are some of the um, principles of this corrosive ideology? So some of the, the features of it are going to be, I mean, first of all, none of these things are consistent. So you would imagine at least an ideology would want to stick to some degree of logical consistency. And you realize it's fraught with, with logical consistencies. But one of the, at the base of this is a, a tacit hatred or an overt hatred of, of God and Christianity, a rejection of objective truth. So the thought that all language, uh, you know, us talking right now or making the claim the cat is on the mat or I was born in 1980, that these these claims aren't objective in any sense that two plus two is four, right? That there's no objective truth that at base, all language, all claims are, it's fundamentally just power. And this is derived from idiots like Michel Foucault and Derrida and whatnot. So that I think is at the, the base of things. So it's a rejection of God, a rejection of the possibility of objective truth, that all language claims are at base power relationships and that everybody who is not uh, of the Western heritage, Christian, European, American, male, patriarchal, uh, conservative, is straight. Has gotten any type of any type of advantage or hierarchy that is unjust? I guess that's the other thing. All hierarchies are unjust, and that unrelenting equality or equity, uh, equality of outcome, n needs to be the solution. And then lastly, you can see this with the LGBTQ IIAP plus. The plus is a placeholder for anything, for any new victim group. 
pedophilia, bestiality, necrophilia, polyamory, whatever, right? Whatever, whatever you can imagine, you know, there's some in principle marginalized group that gets tacked on to this in principle infinite set of rights claims or, or equity claims. So the revolution never ends. There is no, there's no end state to it. So it's not a pendulum. It's a one way ratchet. It's a one way ratchet towards perfect unending equity. Hmm. <laughs> you keep saying, well, they use these words. They, the, a lot of these words are, are weaponized, like you said. So, you know, equity, equality, Ultimately, for these things to exist the way that people are suggesting them or that the universities are suggesting them, uh, there has to be complete chaos because then everything is subjective, subjective. So it's whatever I think, whatever I feel, whatever I come up with, whatever mm -hmm. yeah. it, it, the word perversion is to, you know, to, to, to change something. I can make anything I want to make it. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, it sounds like do what thou wilt is the whole of the law mm. it's diabolical yeah. uh, mm -hmm. i had christopher west on here before and he he mentioned the difference between this so diabolical is to separate to make two what was one which is mm. uh, symbolical then you know he went into a, a great talk about how we're you know symbolized by god we're we're sim we're symbiotic we're not diabolic but this this splitting that we have because everyone is their own god is diabolical mm. And I would propose, and I would love to hear your thoughts on even the uni even the reason why people are willing to go to universities is because of this uh, narrative that is pumped into our soft brains through uh, Disney and music and media and so forth. Is that my life needs to be some grand, unique, wild ride mm -hmm. experience? Uh, mm -hmm. That is that's that's discovered by following my passion. I remember being caught up in this idea for so long, but it's my passion. So and then everything becomes subjective, and we literally become our own gods. And it sounds so seductive. That's the problem, you know. I'm, as I say this, there may be people that rub that knock their head and say, "Why wouldn't I want to follow my passion, Elliot? You said follow your passion. You're following your passion, and look." But that doesn't mean that life is not going to be a constant dopamine rush that you're doing something new unique novel and and experimenting with the natural law anyway rant over just want to know your thoughts on that it's it's sort of a, a pervasive societal mindset i agree i totally agree i mean you see this is one of the other things we mentioned in that fox news article is that the uh the the, the academy or college campuses they become this kind of adult daycare and the ethic that you just talked about gets pumped <laughs> into their heads there. So, I mean, there, you go, why do you go to college? You go there to, to find yourself and then you can, you travel abroad to, to find right. yourself. And, and once again, you can hear this elements of the, the enlightenment Lockean tabula rasa anti Aristotelian view, right? That, that you don't have a nature. It, it's, it's on you to, to go out and just, figure you know to yeah to try different things and and you're going to find yourself as opposed to the christian and aristotelian view that you there's no self to find you have a nature you have a nature that is directed ultimately towards god and that's the only thing that is going to satisfy one one's orientation towards god like that's the that's what we're, we're beings oriented towards god so if you remove that and you remove a notion of telos, then you're left with what? Um, all these girls going off to college and they all major in psychology, right? Like 90% of them major in psychology. And then they say, oh, I, 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 I got to figure out who I am and I'll, I'll get this psychology degree that's going to fill my head with theories to, to tell me that, you know, this theory or that theory or that this, you know, I got to go off and travel and figure out these things to find myself what is there to find you are a human being you are a man or a woman you're oriented towards right. god you're oriented towards family towards towards citizenship towards nation uh this towards motherhood, these aren't you know the, towards that's motherhood a, that's exactly a big part yeah. of the destruction of our society is this uh mm -hmm. turning away from motherhood uh fatherhood and family and so you know not i'm not i'm not sexist i have three daughters but I tell them even, I have three teenage daughters that, you know, don't turn away from the idea of motherhood. Don't don't eschew 
wanting to be a wife and a mother uh, as some sort of a, 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 a less than favorable choice in life. Because there are a lot of these women with these high degrees uh, climbing the corporate ladder that are ultimately miserable. And so finding, yeah, again, that is... whole idea of needing to find oneself, why does it have to be an expensive, dangerous journey only to find out, hey, I really should have just stayed with what I was, which is a young lady that would that is created in the image of God, which is represented in my union with man and procreation. Like that's a good that's a good starting place for what we are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and you'll you you'll hear these folks. They'll try to bombard men and women going to college as well. This is all just a social construct. That, no, it isn't. I mean, you see cross culturally across all ages. <laughs> right. <laughs> when boys get together, what do they do? They 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 pick up sticks and rocks and they 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 play fight or they real fight. When girls get together, they 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 pick up dolls and they they mimic motherhood. This isn't. This isn't some cultural social brainwashing. This is cross-culturally everywhere because we are the types of <laughs> beings that are wired and naturally directed towards those things. And it requires this, this entire trillion-dollar apparatus to graft over the world and, and brainwash these folks. You know, I, I fell into it myself for decades right. That's a social of propaganda only for them to realize on the other side that it's they still want want fatherhood and motherhood even despite all the, all the indoctrination right. yeah absolutely yeah you'll you'll always make your way back yeah nature 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 can't be resisted nature I comes hear back you saying nature and so yeah. you know there's one yeah. term that i've has become uh more prolific in my language since becoming catholic is natural law natural law there's a natural law uh, you don't hear too much about that in the, in the way mm. that we're talking about in terms yeah. of there's a way that things just are and th it needs to be honored. And mm -hmm, if not, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to suffer. Would you yep. be willing to, you, you keep using the term uh, aristotomist, yep. right? That's also new to me, but I understand we're talking about Aristotle and uh, Thomas Aquinas and, and those being the two great minds i don't know if you would call them scholars but you know philosophy and theology that built the west of course we hear more neo marxist mm -hmm. stuff today our whole society is basically built off of karl marx in a way i mean there's, there's guys that pre predated him i mean there's a lot going on there but the opposite of that that we lived for say 2000 years was aristotomist could you tell me more about that, where that word comes from, what that's all about, and what are the principles mm -hmm. of coming back home? Right, yeah, yeah. So in brief, uh, Aristotle had, was trying to articulate an account of the intelligibility of the world and causality, and he had this theory of four causes. So the, the formal, the efficient, um, the final, and the um, material cause. So if I have a table, for instance, right? So that the material cause of the table is, is like what it's made out of. It's substance. It's wood. The formal cause is the shape that it's a table and not a chair or a, um, you know, a cuckoo clock. Uh, the efficient cause is the processes by which the uh, the table is made. So you can picture the, a, a woodworker, you know, chiseling the, uh, the, um, the table into existence. And then the final cause, and this, this is the big, big, element that was removed from the western mind was uh, also known as telos is the well what is the table for right what in the mind of the creator in the mind of the sculptor why is he making this thing it's like oh well he wants this thing that he can put things on so he can he can write he can eat he can have people over and and they can they can have a, a party and, and have a dinner around it and if you remove any of those things uh, then it ceases to, to be a table, right? I can't have a table made out of wa liquid water. Uh, if it's shaped like a chair, it's, you know, it's not going to be a table, it's, et cetera. When uh, Thomas gets a hold... So, I mean, all, all these things, that, you know, by the way, this, this last idea of final causality points to not just a small-scale human creator, but a big creator, right? So we can look out and look at the world and we can see final formal efficient material causality in the apprehendable and intelli intelligible world so that's what aristotle the aristotelian that's amazing yep. if i could just you know sum up what you're saying everything is created for yes. a reason yep. there you go 
and it's created in such a way that it will fulfill its mm -hmm. purpose. And as long as its purpose, as long as it's being used in the way that it was designed to yes. be used, its purpose is fulfilled. Yes. And, you know, that's a hard thing for the modern mind to accept because that means there's a right and a wrong way to do things. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. And that I'm not free to make my choice about the way I think it should look. And it's so funny because, you know, if we're actually trying to find ourselves, why not read the user's yes. manual? Mm -hmm. Why not go to what our creator had in mind? But there is no creator, and so th this is why we have the diabolical. Is that right? Mind. Yeah. So the yeah. So the one might just say, well, yeah, follow your conscience. Tr you know, trust what your gut instinct and what what nature is telling you to to do, and do that. And you, know, you could see something like how pernicious something like um, contraception is towards uh, blocking what those uh, or, or homosexuality or homosexual practices. Now you can suddenly see. If there is telos and purpose in the world towards flourishing, towards a thing, you know, or humans in particular, creatures realizing their full flourishing, their full actuality, the things that get in the way and block these things are going to be wrong and, and, and disordered. So, yeah, every, everything has a purpose. Human beings have a unique purpose ordered towards the creator. Thomas reads Aristotle and and rehabilitates this in light of uh, Revelation and, and Christ's coming and says Aristotle like he almost gets there he points towards God but we don't have a intervening you know the creator coming as man to to really hammer the point home and and uh, instruct his creations so Aquinas really becomes the the, the articulation of early Christian thought and, and Aristotelian thought and uh and, and he helps put those things together and then in terms of natural law uh he articulates you know any number of things particularly the idea of act and potency so you can have um something having the, the potential like a, a acorn has the potential of becoming a tree a woman has the potential of becoming a mother a, a man and woman have the potential of becoming a family uh, disaggregated groups of families have the potential to become a nation and a, and a well-ordered civilization, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so natural law then builds up and then we can get, you know, various notions of social order and governance uh, from, from these ideas. You know, it sounds, first thing I want to say is it sounds hard, right? Because it requires an act mm. of the will uh, to, to ascend to some of these ideas that you're proposing, like, uh, especially for our postmodern mind, that you know my potential is a is as a woman, but now I have to fight against the pressures of the world, you know, as a, as a woman to not you, you know. In other words, it's easy to go with the flow. It's easy to to go with the current thing. I think G. J. Kesterson said that uh, to to go with the current means that you're mm. dead. And so only dead wood goes with the current, but it's so easy to go with the current thing uh, that it's, of course, you know, it almost is like counterculture, some of this Aristotomist stuff that you're talking about. It's so foreign to the modern mind that, well, there's a way for a man to be, or there's a way for a family to be where we're told, oh, there's all different kinds of families. There's all different kinds of men. Men can have uh, babies too. We're told all these wild and wacky ideas that I, it, it almost seems like, you know, I think Paul says somewhere in the Bible about the darkening of the mm, intellect. Yeah. I think it was in Romans that our in, when we don't have God, our intellect gets so darkened that we basically fall for anything. And so this laziness is almost like God offers us up. He says this in Romans too, that God offers us up to our sins, like we mm, indulge mm. in them. And it's so easy. It's so pervasive. And it, it's it's so effeminate meaning like there's no challenge uh, yeah yeah i think we get a great challenge in our day which is to return to these aristotomist ideas my question uh for you uh, along that lines is where did first of all where did the aristotomist natural law everything has its purpose and its place and there's a right way to do things and of course you know the, the the inclusion of theology. Where did that? When in our history did that flourish? What were the fruits? And where did we 
drop the ball. And, you know, I know you probably mentioned the Enlightenment or something like that, but I just kind of want to know the history of these ideas. I would say, I mean, even, yeah, going back prior to the Enlightenment, I think you'd really have to, if Enlightenment liberalism is secular Protestantism, then really you'd have to go back to, to Martin Luther and the beginning of Pro- Protestantism as being the, 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 the major split where you start you start to seeing a, a falling away from papal authority and and uh, the a lineage a patriarchal an unbroken lineage from God to Christ to Peter through the uh, early church fathers to uh, all the way to Luther. So I think that even prior to secular uh, modern enlightenment accounts of you know all, all these various like social contract theory guys, whether it's Locke or Hobbes. Or um, uh, Kant and, and whatnot, right? They're they're all hitting the ground running, articulating a kind of secular Protestantism that is assuming an anthropology of man that is not uh, Catholic and is it's not Aristotelian, right? It's removed of final causality. It's removed of purpose, and that's why you can then look at any number of these contractualist accounts that say, okay, well, we're all just, just bare minds with no, no, uh, uh, direction. And we can, we can choose our own individual flourishing. And now let's just sort out amongst ourselves. We'll, we'll just, you know, you do you, I'll do me. And, uh, we just won't harm one another. And we'll have like th- theories of property rights or something that that will be what, um, we, we now hold as, uh, the arbiter of, how we interact. And, uh, you know, so I think the, the big fissures, yeah, it, it starts with Martin Luther and this in, the individual interpretation of, of, of the Bible. And then that iterates itself in secular humanist versions of you, you right, do you. Scripture and tradition. Yep. Yes. Make it up our own rules. Yep. So can I ask you, you know, a lot of this is new to me. I'm learning as I go along. Um, I've learned that the Dark Ages maybe weren't so dark. And I think another way we can describe it is as the Middle Age, the Middle Ages. Am I correct or correct me and, and please lead me the right way. But when and where in Western culture did the Aristotomist uh, worldview hold sway and what were the fruits thereof? Yeah, yeah, this is yeah during, during the Middle Ages and the, the, the Scholastic uh, period. And uh, this is where you would would have found, um, amongst other things, the the beginning of the university system in in France, that uh, had a noble class that was taught by you know pious theistic monks monk scholars uh, that then informed you know military statesmen, law, medicine, etc. And then that had trickled down to uh, you know various guilds and uh various tradesmen and, and the um warriors so you had a much more integrated society and an integrated set of persons that you know it wasn't just a, a morass of individuals all scrambling to find themselves or to enact their own their own purpose it was a, a well-ordered society with a notion of where one fits into it uh everybody oriented towards towards the most high and uh you know a um a, a thick notion of the common good as opposed to an absence of the common good and everybody just kind of you know y- you keep politics and religion in your private space and we'll just do economic reaction uh economic interactions in, in the the common space and uh you can look at the architecture at the time the architecture was built upon you know uh aristotelian principles of of form and uh and purpose and uh like likewise with the artwork likewise with the the um inventions and um yeah infrastructure so there was maximal coherence in in that time period you used the word scholastic there before and that's a term that we use when you think you know being schooled Mm -hmm. Um, am I correct in my assertion that it was the church that started the first universities? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, this is uh, in uh, in France in particular. French monks, the uh, yeah, the universitas was the 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 first formal iteration of of the university system, and yeah, that's 
that that was where where we've um that's that's our heritage oh, it's amazing because it's been weaponized against us it, it, it's a complete inversion. <laughs> i wonder if yeah. there are any really good aristotomist yeah um you know classical catholic there are universities or schools yeah. out there anymore because even if you go to a, you know i went to a catholic university and there was nothing catholic about what we were doing there <laughs> yeah the uh um, that's really unfortunate uh particularly yeah you look at uh, boston college or georgetown which are, are even when i was at notre dame there was uh is nominally catholic but it, it you could definitely feel how secular it had become i guess if if people are interested in trying to find classic Aristotomist universities. The the Newman list that we, we list in the book, if you go to the Newman schools, there's 20 or so Newman list schools that are that, that meet the, the Newman list criteria as as counting as actual real deal Aristotomist. That's helpful. So there's still places that haven't been infected by the by the rot, but uh you, you gotta you really gotta do your research. But there are there are islands. There there are places it's, it's not it's not fully. It's just uh, don't go to ninety nine point nine percent of college. Just didn't work so well for a, a title. So the universities, these secular universities, you know, they're weaponized in that they change our mind, right? So we got critical mm -hmm. theory yeah. and you know the, the the diabolical teachings of these universities, but also they're they're an economic weapon yes. against the mm -hmm. youth because now the, you know at least in America. It is now a ball and chain that they have to drag. Of course, that was the first thing that tipped mm, me mm -hmm. off to university being a hoax and then learning about, you know, the Federal yep, Reserve yep. Bank and the banking system and, you know, how it really is a ball and chain. Um, you mentioned, I love the fact that you brought up the Newman mm -hmm. list. You know, I'm not a scholar, but I'm a very curious guy. I like learning. I enjoy reading. Uh, what, so you mentioned there are a handful of universities that are worth going to. Why would someone, you know, given that we're, it, we're not looking at the university in terms of an ep economic weapon, but as a cultivation of the soul. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, you know, maybe there's economic benefit to it. I don't want to discount that. Um, mm -hmm. Why would one choose to go to even one of these universities? So I could see a, a variety of, of answers. One, if you really do feel a calling to learn about theology and Christian thought in, in depth taught by experts, then that'd be a reason to go. Uh, another reason would be to, if you wanted to, to be a lawyer or doctor or, you know, some type of engineer that required that type of, um, precise, um, technical training. Um, I, a caveat to that. So many folks think, well, I'll just, you know, I'll send my kid to STEM and uh, he'll be fine. Dude, STEM is most STEM is now woke as well. So you're not doing just bare bones science. Right. It's it's ideo it's politically, uh, ideologically laden science. Uh, so be careful with that. Um, and I guess the other reason you look at something like Steubenville, for instance, right? Uh, Steubenville has uh, St. Joseph the Workers uh, College, which is sort of attached to it, where you can go and you can get a uh, a sped up in the trades and be out the door with a, a degree in the trades that is also informed by a, a Christian uh, pedagogy or Catholic pedagogy and be out the door making. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Really? So something like that. That is pretty amazing. So St. Joseph, the worker, they teach skills, trades like, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, to be an electrician or, you yeah. know, to fix automobiles yeah. or it's like a Catholic uh, trade construction. School. Yeah. Wow, yep. amazing! That that I think that 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 has That's to be the model. That's super cool. Going I love that they call it Saint Joseph yep. the Worker. Exactly. So, um, so that that might be a reason. So those those are the wow. ones I could think of. You know, theology, um, some of the the higher order professions that require you know a little bit of technical smarty pants knowledge, and then trades, but trades that are oriented in the direction of of uh, Christ, not just trades for trade's sake. So I think those to my mind though that's an excellent model and this is an updated model of what the old university system uh would it would have looked like so wow and i guess you know the way forward is the mm -hmm. way back yeah. because it's the only thing that sounds like it makes any sense to me <laughs> you know the whole university system has been uh subverted yep. of course infiltrated and subverted from mm -hmm. without uh it's become a weapon it's it's weaponized uh, against our souls and against our uh economic well-being for the most part 
Um, but also, you know, along the same lines, weaponized against the mm. family. Mm -hmm. And I think we spoke briefly about that. Um, let's, would you be willing to talk, you know, we're kind of going back and forth here. I'm, I'm loving hearing about the Aristotomics and, you know, uh, St. Joseph the Worker and all these wonderful things. Um, but just in contrast, and, you know, think about St. Joseph, right? If we're going to be talking about St. Joseph, not only was he a worker, but he was the man that raised Christ and served his mother and a really good mm -hmm. example of what a father could be in a well-ordered world. We have the opposite of that with the fruits of the secular university mm -hmm. system. Maybe talk a little bit about how university destroys families. Yeah, yeah, certainly. This is this is the the other main thing. So yeah, we had destroys your mind, destroys your wallet. Uh, it's adult daycare and a, a haven of sexual vice that stunts human development, that stunts <laughs> families. Uh, fourth one, STEM is woke, and then the fifth was that it bleeds. These these ideas bleed out beyond beyond the campus. So this th third point, yeah, it it is now adult daycare where both men and women are being bombarded by anti-family, anti-natalism, anti-nature, anti-man, anti-woman, anti-patriarchy ideology. And then while they're there, the they're encouraged to, to fornicate and to experiment with all sorts of sexual vice. And then the degree that they're getting almost all the time, where's, where are their degrees? The degrees, they're not out in the country or the, um, not degrees, uh, internships. The internships are in a major city. So now they are shunted into the city and they have to delay finding a, a, a loyal partner a, another 5, 10, 15 years while they're, they're working off the student loans in the, uh, the, the city, which itself is also a, a, a haven for more uh, sexual degeneracy, vice, etc. And then you have all these like pro professional people coming out of the cities with all these degrees, all these student debt, tons of, of vicious um, sexual vice, and, and they want families. And I'm like, this has to be the most roundabout way in which to do something, possibly. W why not just yeah, get out of high school, get a trade, <laughs> get married, start your life, start your, start your family early, which like we used to do prior, prior to the 1960s. So it's it just... Uh, the university, it's, it's, it starts a trajectory for men and young men and women that puts a, a, a block or stunts their development to, to, to find one another to get married and to start, to start families. It, it starts a trajectory that puts 5, 10, 15 year gap uh, in being able to do that. And for a lot of folks, not at all. And that, that's, that it starts with, with the vicious universities. You know, uh, Almost as if it were designed against uh, against uh, uh, people. Yeah. Right. Designed to destroy us in every which way possible. I'm going to risk sounding uh, yeah. misogynistic yeah. right now. That's the fancy word to say sexist. Um, but would you be willing to speak to how the ills of delaying family and childbirth and the foray into university is far worse for women than men? Yeah, certainly, certainly. Uh, Tim points this out in his book, The Case for Patriarchy, that, that everybody should pick up. But there was a discussion between Simone de Beauvoir, and I'm forgetting the, the, her American equivalent at the time. Um, I forget. The, the second sex and whatever, whatever the other, whatever the American feminist was. And they pretty much had this debate as to whether or not we should, uh, whether or not the feminist ethic should encourage women to, strongly encourage women to, to be careerists, but also leave open the idea of the family versus they should encourage women to only be careerists and not eat, and, and to, to uh, hate the idea of being, being mothers and, and family and women altogether. And they had, they had a big debate about this. But the point being, these people came out with the intention of, of, of weaponizing women and, and, and nudging them and propagandizing, propagandizing them into the workforce. This wasn't um, some organic 
idea. This is a, a set of people that that really hated the family and they they hated themselves and they they hated um God, and uh, their efforts were to weaponize women against men and against the family. Um, so that is the background. And then in terms of uh, just how bad it is for for women, yeah, it 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 shackles them with debt and it it. it Ladens them with 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 sexual vice and baggage, and that's going to be a detractor for uh, a lot of traditionally minded men that want wives that they can trust. And uh, you know, but this is this is the indoctrination that they're they're getting hit with um, both barrels at the university and in culture. I don't need a man. You're independent. But then, yeah, these women later on in life, they they want to settle down and actually nat- nature tells them in their hearts that they are mothers or that, or that they want to become mothers and they want to be nurturing. And then it's, it's on the other end, tragically of this like 15 year indoctrination project. Right. It's, it's actually such a shame. It's sad to see. Uh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. So we're coming up on an hour here. There's, there's so much good stuff. Um, where do I, where do we want to go with this next? So, you know, I've I've very early on decided that college was a hoax. It, it didn't go this deep. We're going real deep right now. These are all things that I've just learned and I'm learning over the past, mm-hmm. you know, half a decade. Um, for me, it was more economical. It, d- it didn't seem like it made sense. Um, and mm-hmm. I, I, it was very clear, to even to my children, it's funny, uh, they all knew that they weren't going to college. It was funny because I grew up knowing I was going to college. My dad was like, you're going to college. My dad's from Belize and they came to America so their kids can do American mm-hmm. things. And so you're going to college. So I, I grew up knowing I'm going to college. My children grew up knowing they're not going to college. And it's so funny because, you know, they're ve- especially one of my daughters is very well adept uh, socially and gets along well with adults. And, you know, one of the first things that they'll ask her if we're in company uh, is okay. So where are you going to college? Because she's so well spoken and she carries herself so well, and uh, she mm-hmm, mm-hmm. very quickly would uh, rebuttal. Oh, I'm not going to college, and she's opinionated too because she listens to my opinions and my wife's opinions. So it was always cute to see how mm-hmm, you know pe- mm-hmm, how shocked mm-hmm. people are when they hear a young lady say something like that, almost because you know th- the indoctrination, mm-hmm. but also the next question is, well, what are you going to do? as if there's no other potential, there's no other course uh, that's available to young mm-hmm, people. Mm-hmm. Maybe you can talk to what is actually available outside of the university uh, funnel. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And and yeah, I I was hit with that, the same narrative that you were when we were growing up, is this, it, you could question everything but this anxiety producing producing narrative that your life is ruined if you don't you, you're you're being negligent if you don't go to right. college. I'm a bad parent. Uh, it was just pounded into the head of our our generation and uh, exactly yeah yeah. So I would say for men in particular, I would say in if you have unless you have a strong calling towards the clergy or towards ministry and and theology, I would say stay local learn a trade you could th- there's been this this shaming this this stigmatization of blue collar work and using your hands and being able to 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 do dirty man's jobs and that's the only it's one of the only stigmatizations that is still like allowed in this supposedly open minded society <laughs> that we're in uh, there's a reason for that they want to, to because that's going to that's going to make you strong and independent and less manageable so the more you can grow your own food, fix your own stuff, you know, you're, you're connected to the means by which you can um, prosper and, and um, be independent, that's going to be shunned. That's going to be propagandized away from you. So do the opposite. Uh, you know, learn a trade or at least be, um, you know, uh, at a university that can offer those types of things. For, for folks that really want to do STEM, law, medicine stuff, find a Newmanless school and go and and uh, go there. Hillsdale might also be it be an option, you know. But go to a conservative school and uh, try to get married, settle young, right? Start a family <laughs> young and and get 
get away from the from the the the, the cities and the universities and this this sort of space of uh, ideological satanic nonsense. Uh, for women, I would say it's you know the they're really trying to weaponize women uh, against men and against families, right? So they're they're targeting even more so. And I would just give the same uh, prescription that Gavin McGinnis gave to, to women. He said, uh, you know, w women, it's like they're Clark, they're Superman and Clark Kent. It's like you have this, <laughs> this magical metaphysical power to bear human life. You, you, you have this superpower, but the universities are telling you, you need to be, you need to be a journalist. You need to be Clark Kent hanging out in the newsroom trying to you know write journalism and you need to outdo all the journalists in the uh, in the newsroom now you know could could Clark Kent write decent uh, news articles yeah sure he's probably an okay journalist but if that's at the expense of being Superman like what is he doing he, he's squandering his his natural superpowers and you know so I'm not saying women would be you know that they couldn't be good doctors lawyers professionals but if it's at the expense of this God-given superpower, then that's the problem. So don't let them shame you into being a mediocre, like, okay, Clark Kent. Be the best Superman you could possibly be, or, you know, in this case, Superwoman. So you have natural <laughs> capacities to bear human life. It's the most precious God-given thing possible, which is why they want to lie to you and and steal that from you. So right. that's, that's my thoughts on uh, prescriptions towards women. Uh, I, briefly, I'd like to just throw this one in here before we wrap up. Um, also, I think we have to add what happens to men and women together. We spoke about what, you know, men, a good course of action for men, a good course of action for women. Um, mm. Can we talk about how promiscuity is so damaging to both genders, to both sexes, obviously to the family yes. and, and the virtue that's available in chastity. Yeah. Yeah. This is another thing. I mean, I, if folks listen on the sea mask episodes and they'll, they'll know my background or if they listen to all my other stuff, but if this is the first time uh, encountering my work, uh, I have to say that there was a time when I encountered philosophy and, and the atheism was really pushed hard on me. And then I fell away from the church and from Catholicism. And then I got into the, the red pill pickup world and I led a very shameful, promiscuous life during, during that time period. And by the grace of God, I, I woke up to, to how, just how bad and uh, vicious and, and morally sinful that was. And, and I was brought, brought back, back to realizing what, what was at stake. But um, that's, that ethic um, is so per pernicious to everybody, to families, to society, uh, and to men as well. And there's this ethic right now that the men are being hit with that to be a real man, you have to to be this Don Juan and, and to, to have lots of conquests, etc. And that you have to uh, take on these attributes that, to, you know, to attract as many women as possible, etc. This Hugh Hefner lifestyle is, is pushed down men's throats. And that in the Red Pill community, it's it's pitched as being that's masculine and that's somehow anti-feminine. But as our friend Will Nolan has put out, that that's actually promoting this um, feminist, neo-Marxist, big state, big big government, um, uh, world government ethos, right? Because if you don't have men pairing up with women and starting families and then having networks of families that can protect one another and be a nation, then what you end up having is a cucking of the men in the society by the by the nanny state that comes in and that becomes the surrogate father and the surrogate family and and then you're a slave class right so it's it's not masculine or alpha at all um, nor is it anti-state uh, nor is it anti-left it's promoting the left it's promoting the uh, new world order by being uh, promiscuous as a man and it's also damaging to your soul and everybody else around you. So um, I think that's a narrative that really needs to be be pointed out, that it's not, uh, it's, and it's also hypocritical, right? I mean, there's a time where it's like, oh, cool, like I, I um, you know, I want a woman who's, who's trustworthy, but I'm acting in ways that are not trustworthy at all. Like, so um, it's a, 
it's a whole nest of bad ideas, but it's, um, you know, I'll, I'll stop there. I'm kind of ranting. If I could sum it up, you know, our whole conversation really, obviously don't go to college, but what reasons why uh, we have a, obviously from the root, a different worldview today than uh, that which bit, w built Western civilization. We learned and that's called Aristotomism. And it means that uh, we all have a place, we all have a purpose, and we all have a, a, a real way of being. Uh, and then the universities as a means of, of, of switching that up on us, uh, not just changing our worldview, but changing our behavior. And I really appreciate Michael uh, going as far as how the university system, the paradigm, uh, not only affects, you know, our, our worldview, but our world itself, which of course, you know, is a, is a byproduct of our worldview. And that maybe going to university isn't such a good idea because it's causing much of the ills of society, including the breakdown of the family. And on the other side of that, along with the Aristotomist view, is perhaps a good way of moving into adulthood is by first considering being a family, having a wife, having a husband, making babies, being a provider and protector and a nurturer and mom. So that's a little bit of what I gleaned from our amazing conversation. Dr. Michael, thank you for joining us, brother. Uh, before we go, can you tell me and our audience, you know, you, you're a scholar, dude. And so I know you do a, a lot of writing and you're, you share these ideas. So basically, Michael, I'm asking, where can people learn more about your work and connect with what you do, dude? Awesome. Thanks, Elliot. Uh, so folks can find me at uh, michaelrobillard.com. You can find me on Twitter as uh, robillarddr and uh, also on Substack. I have a, a uh, Substack article there or Substack you know, set of articles. Uh, you can find me on CMask on Fridays with Elliot, Tim Gordon, myself, and Will Noland. And uh, Will Noland and I also have a book reading um, a book club that we do on Tuesdays, going over classic Western, you know, best of the West uh, books and articles. Uh, I also have a one-hour interview on Tucker Carlson today that you can find on Fox Nation uh, if you have that particular uh, app or uh, subscription. And then the book is uh, Don't Go to College, A Case for Revolution. And you can find that on all major distributors, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, etc. Amazing. Thank you once again, Michael. And if you want to get yeah, any if you want to get any type of grappling or wrestling or MMA uh, stuff, you can find me at South Shore Sport Fighting in uh, Rockland on the weekends. Hey, that's awesome. Yeah, you're an athlete also, dude. Well, I appreciate your time, man. I'm looking forward to uh, continuing to learn from you. I enjoy speaking with you every Friday. And it was such a pleasure to have you on the show today, Michael. Same here. My, my pleasure as well. Bye. That's it. That's all we done, folks. Until next time, done. If you're a high-achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details hope to see you on the inside done